event. And that's it for housekeeping. That's it for housekeeping. That was easy. So I'd now like to introduce. So I'd now like to introduce tonight's ask the experts moderator. Ask the experts moderator. Dr. Smitabatia established, established the Department of Population Sciences, Sciences at City of Hope in 2006. Uh, she is the first, uh, holder, she is of the first holder of the Ruth Ziegler Chair in Population Sciences. In Population Sciences. She serves, as, she the serves as the associate chair for the Children's Oncology Group, Oncology group coordinating survivorship, coordinating survivorship research, research across 200 pediatric oncology institutions, oncology institutions, institutions in, the United States. in the United States. Dr. Bonte was elected, Dr. Bonte to, was elected to membership in the American Society for Clinical Investigation in recognition of meritorious, of meritorious and, outstanding and outstanding contributions as a physician scientist. She is the recipient, she is the recipient of the Frank H. Oski Lectureship, Oski Lectureship, Lectureship Award from the American, from the American Society of Pediatric Hematology Oncology to honor outstanding investigation in pediatric hematology oncology. In 2012, in 2012 Dr. Bhatia was, was, elected, to was elected to the Board of Directors for the American Society of, Society of Clinical Oncology. Would you please help me welcome Dr. Smita Bhatia. Good evening, folks. Um, today, we today have we have an evening packed with different four aspects different aspects of, uh, of uh, health-related health issues. Health -related well, we want to make well, sure the underlying theme gets across, theme to, gets across to you, which is health, which health, is health, maintenance. health maintenance. The important thing is, so the important thing is how using the different, using the different that techniques will that will be shown to you by our, by our four speakers, you can come you can away come with a very comprehensive and global approach approach maintaining to maintaining your health. Your health. Um, um, we, practice we practice this, we enforce it, we encourage it at least, for our childhood, for our childhood cancer survivors, cancer survivors as, much as, as much as we can. And why do we do we that? Do that we now, do that because now we are very, we pleased, are very to pleased to say that our survival, that our survival rates, for rates for childhood cancer survivors exceeds, childhood cancer patients exceeds 80 percent. In some cases, it, in exceeds, some cases 95%. it exceeds 95 percent. And so our and so responsibility, our responsibility as, physicians as physicians is not been only to ensure that every child, that every gets, child the right gets the right treatment and, and survives the cancer. But also but also to make sure that they leave a, lead a very healthy and very productive life, similar to their siblings, similar to their friends, um, such that nothing that is related to the cancer or its treatment has a major negative impact on their long-term health. So without further ado, I want to introduce the first speaker. <clears throat> As I'd said, we have four speakers today. What I want you all to do is to make sure that you hold your questions till the end because we're going to have our speakers come and sit here and then help answer all your questions. And I forgot to ask Carla if we've given everybody pieces of paper we have. We, you all have the equipment to write with um, and uh, make sure your questions are jotted down as the individual speakers come up and give their talks so you don't forget at the end the questions that you wanted to ask. So our first speaker is Carla Wilson. Carla is a, a family nurse practitioner in the Childhood Cancer Survivorship Program um, at City of Hope. Um, she has, get this, more than 35 years of experience in the field of pediatric oncology. She started working when she was five years old. She has expertise in the care of children with neural tumors, such as brain tumors, and also because of her absolutely critical involvement in our Childhood Cancer Survivorship Program, she is clearly an expert on this issue. Our talk her, today our talk is going to focus on health maintenance for childhood cancer survivors. Carla? Thank you. And I have my cup of green tea today because I have a little bit of a uh, allergy problem, so I apologize for that. So welcome, everyone. And what I'd like to start out, as Dr. Bhatia said, talk a little bit about health maintenance. But I'm going to talk about health maintenance in general, but then how it's applicable to someone who is a childhood cancer survivor, some because there will be some differences. There's something that we have here in the United States called the United States Preventative Service Task Force. And that is an organization that was created about 30 years ago. And it's comprised of experts 
who through their expertise and through evidence and through research come up with recommendations for how people should be screened for a variety of things. And tonight I'm going to specifically comment on some of the issues related to cardiovascular health and screenings for um, cancers. These tend to be age related and they are also gender related. So obviously there might be some differences for males and females. And the benefit of screening is so that any problem or potential problem can be identified early so appropriate interventions can be taken because the goal is to have good health and have good quality of life. So for childhood um, uh, cancer survivors, it's important to follow the normal health care screenings that are recommended for your age. But if you have any special issues, you need to do those screenings as well. So the differences that might occur will be if uh, a, rec a recommendation might be to have a mammogram at age 40, and I'll go into this a little bit more detail later. But if you had certain treatment as a childhood cancer survivor, it might be that you should be getting mammograms at an earlier age. And so we'll talk about those types of differences. So there are some cancer treatments that can change what the standard risk factor is for a disease as you age. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. So it's key, if you are a childhood cancer survivor, and I think there are some people in the audience who aren't just childhood cancer survivors, but maybe they're adult cancer survivors. So I think this is important for you as well. But you should know what your treatment was, and you should have a record of that treatment so that you can share it with your healthcare providers. And you need to be very informed about your own health. And in addition to that, you know, you need to learn what are your risk factors that may be different because of the treatment that you've had. In our program, we follow something called the Children's Oncology Group um, Healthcare um, Long-Term Follow-Up Guidelines. And this is how we screen people. We screen them based on their specific treatment to see what risk factors they have. So this is very individualized. So if you had treatment A, you might have these risk factors, and if you had treatment B, you would have different risk factors. And we want to be able to give you what are specific to you and not have you being um, concerned about things that you aren't at risk for. This is a public website, and it's at um, www.survivorshipguidelines.org. So anyone can go and look up the, this information online. So for cardiovascular health screening, if you are a healthy adult, generally you need a blood pressure screening every two years as long as your blood pressure is normal. And what's considered a normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. If your blood pressure is greater than that consistently, you should have screening at least on an annual basis. If you do not have risk factors for cardi um, coronary artery disease, um, you should have cholesterol screening at age 35 if you're a male and for, then every five years and if you're a female at age 45 and then every five years. If you are high risk though for coronary heart disease and that could be because you're overweight, it's because you may use tobacco, because you might have hypertension, then that screening should start at age 20 and the screening is going to be more often than every five years, and that's going to be something that's going to be worked out between you and your health care provider. There's also screening now being done for diabetes. It's been found in the last few years that if people consistently have a blood pressure of greater than 135 over 80, they need to be screened for diabetes and may have a test done called a hemoglobin A1C. So this is what's done for the general population. So now I'm going to give you some guidelines that are done for people who might be childhood cancer survivors. You, if you had chemotherapy called anthracycline medications such as donorubicin or doxorubicin or idorubicin, you might need screening um, at a younger age and more frequently. And that's going to be determined based on the age you were treated and the cumulative dose of the chemotherapy that you've had. If you've had radiation to the chest or to the uh, neck or to the brain, you need to be screened at an earlier age 
because you're at greater risk for developing high cholesterol. You're also at greater risk of developing um, obesity and type 2 diabetes. You may also need to have screenings that include EKGs and echoes. Um, and again, those are based on the age you were treated and the cumulative dose uh, and type of treatment that you had. And so it's important that you do know what your treatment is or your treatment was so that you can have the appropriate screening plan developed with your healthcare professional. And best of all worlds would be that if you are a childhood cancer survivor, that you are seen on an annual basis in a long-term follow-up program for childhood cancer survivors where this screening is done. And again, it is customized to the individual person based on their specific treatment. For colorectal cancer screening, typically it starts at age 50. And the type of screening depends on the frequency of the screening. It can be those cards where you do what's called a fecal uh, occult blood that's done on a yearly basis. If you have something called a flexible sigmoidoscopy, that might be done every five years. If you have a colonoscopy, it might be done every 10 years. But if you are a childhood cancer survivor and you received radiation of 3,000 centigrade, which is the uh, dose um, that impacts the colon, then you need to start that screening at either age 35 or 10 years after the treatment was given, to whichever one occurs last. And then you're gonna be getting screened with colonoscopies and that should be done every five years. If you're a childhood cancer survivor who did not have radiation that impacts the colon, then your, your screening is gonna be the same as the general population. If you have oral, um, sorry, everyone should be screened for oral cancers on an annual basis. And that's good dental care. You should also have cleanings at least twice a year because it's actually at the time of those cleanings, those screenings are being done as well. Skin cancer screening is particularly important for the, um, the child and the adolescent and young adult. And part of that is because the damage that you do to your skin when you're young is what causes you to have skin cancers as you get older. And if you intervene and start appropriate skin care at a young age, you're um, able to decrease or minimize some of the damage that might occur. How many people in here had a sunburn as a kid where you got blisters? Quite a few. That puts you at a risk for skin cancer, especially if you're fair skinned. So if we can change the behavior of young people so that they don't get sunburns and they wear things like sunscreen and wear hats, um, avoid being out in the brutal sun between the hottest times of the day, that sort of thing, we can then decrease the incidence of skin cancer as they age. If a childhood cancer survivor had any form of radiation, they should have monthly self-skin exams within the radiation field because the radiation field has a higher incidence of developing a skin cancer than the skin outside the radiation field. And if you're a bone marrow transplant um, survivor who had total body radiation, it means that your entire body has a greater risk of getting skin cancer because of that radiation. And if there are any suspicious lesions, you need to be evaluated by a dermatologist. For cervical cancer, um, women between the ages of 21 and 29 should be screened every three years. Uh, between the ages of 30 and 65, it can be every five years uh, if it includes the human papillomavirus screening as part of that. There's been evidence to show that routine testicular screening does not really provide any value, so there are no recommendations that males have any type of routine testicular screening, but that they seek uh, medical care if they have, feel something abnormal on their testicles. For prostate cancer screening, it starts at age 50, unless you are African American, then it's at age 45. And there are some differences in what type of screening and how it's done. And so that's something that if you're a male and you're in that age range, you should discuss that with your healthcare provider. We recommend the American Cancer Society screening for mammograms. Some of you might have heard some of the 
controversy that occurred a few years ago when there were some differences among groups about what type of screening should be done. But what we recommend is that you have an annual mammogram beginning at age 40, and there's no upper age limit for stopping having those annual mammograms. For self-breast exams, it's an optional type of, of procedure. A few years ago, we recommended that everyone do them always. Now it's felt that they're not quite as, quite as critical. But once, um, but we also recommend a clinical breast exam, and that's a breast exam being done by a healthcare provider every three years. And that's for women in their 20s and 30s. If you're over the age of 40, you should have an annual clinical breast exam. And again, the American Cancer Society says the self-breast exams are optional. If you are high risk for breast cancer, you will need a breast MRI. So what makes a childhood cancer survivor high risk for breast cancer? Well, the number one thing is you have to be female. Um, males who have the same treatment at females that make females high risk do not become high risk for male breast cancer. But if you are female and you've had radiation of 2,000 or higher centigrade to your chest, then you are considered high risk and there are some special screening things that should be done. For some women, Children's Oncology Group recommends that clinical breast exams be done on all females starting at puberty. And if you had that radiation treatment starting at age 25 or after you had the radiation, depending on which one occurs last, you need a clinical breast exam every six months. So that means having a breast exam by a health care provider. You also need to have an annual mammogram and an annual MRI of your breast. And we recommend those be six months apart. So basically you're getting um, screened with a, uh, a radiographic image every six months. And the reason for this is that radiation changes a woman's risk factor for breast cancer. Early detection and early intervention can mean a very large difference between what treatment is needed and it can also impact um, survival of those women who are diagnosed with breast cancer. Again, you can find all of this information at that website I gave you earlier. So again, www.survivorshipguidelines.org. So what are risky behaviors that put you at greater um, chance of having poor health? The number one, of course, is tobacco use. So if you smoke, quit. If you don't smoke, please don't start. Avoid illicit drugs or taking prescription or over-the-counter medications in a way they are unintended. And if you are sexually active, use two methods of birth control to prevent unplanned pregnancy. No birth control is 100% effective, and that's why two are recommended. It's recommended that one of those two types be barrier, which are condoms, to prevent the transmission of disease, because condoms are the only type of birth control that will decrease um, disease spread. If you use alcohol, wait until you're of legal age. And if you do drink, drink in moderation. And moderation is one drink a day for women and two drinks a day for men as a maximum amount of alcohol consumption. And it's considered binge drinking if you have four drinks in a single setting for women and five drinks for, in a single setting for men. And that's because males and females have different metabolic rates. So does anyone know what the definition of one drink is? I ask this to my teenage patients all the time and it's amazing the answers I get. But what it is, a drink is equal to 12 ounces of beer or eight ounces of malt liquor or five ounces of wine or one and a half ounces, which is a shot of an 80 proof distilled um, spirits or liquor, such as vodka or rum. And I'm always amazed at the kids that tell me what they think one drink is. And it's usually much, much larger amounts than what is considered to really. So if you drink alcohol, again, remember, drink in moderation and, and keep your safety and your health in mind. For general healthy living, it's important to eat a healthy diet, and um, you'll be having more information on that shortly. 
It's also important to exercise. And again, there'll be further information. But exercise involves aerobic exercise as well as exercise that will strengthen the muscles and bones. It's important not to take unneeded medicines and be wise when you do use medications. It's important to have regular health care checkups, be immunized, and keep a copy of your immunization record so you know what ha you have and what protection you have. Get a flu shot every year. And again, I'm not going to go into any more detail because um, the next speaker is going to be talking in detail about immunizations. Dental care is so crucial. There's a lot of evidence to show that um, dental health has impact on cardiovascular health. So get those checkups. Take care of your teeth. And I know dental issues can be um, difficult for a lot of people because it's expensive and insurances don't pay well. But make sure that you brush and you floss and you take good care of your teeth and your gums. And look for programs that are out there that will see people on a sliding scale. Wear your seatbelt. If you're less than 12 years of age, um, don't ride in the front seat. The recommendations for car and booster seats have changed a little bit in the last couple years. The recommendations that if it's an infant up to age 12 months, they should be in a rear-facing car seat. Between one to three years, they can go to a front-facing car seat with a harness. Between the ages of four to seven, a child should be in a booster seat until they outgrow whatever the height and weight limits are of their particular seat. At 8 to 12 years, they should also remain in a booster seat until they are large enough that the seat belt comes across their thighs, over their pelvis, and not into their abdomen. It's kind of like when you get on the plane and the air, um, the stewardess um, Say, to put your uh, seatbelt on low and tight across your abdomen. So you want that seatbelt so it's going over the pelvis and over the hip bones and not up at the waist. You also do not want the shoulder harness to be coming across the face or the neck. I've seen people put their kids in a car and they take the shoulder harness and put it behind the child because it comes across here and they only have the lap belt on and that's not very safe. It's important that if you do activities such as biking, skateboarding, rock climbing, etc., that you wear helmets and the appropriate protective gear for those sports. <coughs> Excuse me. So you need to be empowered about your health. And the most important person who can take charge of your health is yourself. So again, know your health history, know what risk factors you have, and know what you should be doing to address those risk factors. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Wendy Landier. Wendy is an assistant professor in the Department of Population Sciences. She's been a pediatric nurse practitioner at City of Hope since 1998 and has served as a clinical director of the Center for Cancer Survivorship since 2006. Her research interests are focused on understanding and improving health outcomes in survivors. She's currently leading a study on human papillomavirus in childhood cancer survivors. She is the chair of the Children's Oncology Group nursing discipline. She's a fellow of the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners and Associates and a recipient of the Excellence in Pediatric Oncology Nursing Education and Distinguished Services Award from the Association of Pediatric Hemonc Nurses. In 2012, she was the first recipient of the Ruby and Roni Award for Outstanding Junior Faculty in Pediatric Cancer Survivorship at City of Hope. Wendy today is going to talk about vaccines for childhood cancer survivors. And I can't find Wendy anywhere. There she is. Thank you. Oops. So why do we need to talk about vaccines for childhood cancer survivors? 
Well, until recent years, died more people died of preventable diseases than of cancer. When you think back to the last century, people were dying of infectious diseases because we didn't have vaccines to prevent them. Modern medicine really has given us a great gift in giving us vaccines. We can prevent some of the most serious diseases that are known to mankind, including smallpox, diphtheria, and polio. We've had vaccines for those for quite some time. And now we have um, vaccines for meningitis, pneumonia, and many other diseases. So before scientists developed vaccines, the only way that you could get immunity to a disease was to actually get sick with it. And for some of these diseases, you would be lucky if you survived. If you did survive, you could develop immunity to the disease. But vaccines really changed all that, so now we can have immunity to these diseases without getting sick. So vaccines teach your body to fight serious diseases without actually getting the disease. And it's certainly an easier and less risky way to become immune. Not only do they protect you, but vaccines actually protect the people around you too. So how do vaccines work? When you receive a vaccine, your immune system develops a memory of how to fight the disease. So that if you ever encounter those germs again, you won't get sick. Your body will be able to mount a response to that disease quite quickly. So vaccines are safe because they don't use the full germ of the disease um, when you get the injection. Some of the vaccines only use a piece of the disease-causing microbe, so a virus or a bacteria might cause the disease, and the vaccine only uses a piece of that. Or if it uses the whole germ, it uses a weakened or a killed form of that germ. So that way, instead of getting the whole germ like you would if you got the disease, you only get a part of it or a weakened um, germ so that you don't get sick. And then your body's immune system takes over and responds to the vaccine by making what we call antibodies. And these antibodies can recognize and quickly destroy those microbes that can cause disease. And this prevents you from getting the disease. So why do we need to give vaccines after cancer treatment? Well, you all remember that immunity is affected during cancer treatment. You remember about low blood counts and having to wear a mask and, and staying away from crowds and all the things when you're in cancer treatment. So the reason for that is because your immune system is weakened by the can during the time that you're getting the cancer treatment. And even if you had vaccines before cancer treatment, sometimes the, that protection can get wiped out by the treatment itself. There are also some cancer treatments that can put you at higher risk for getting certain of the vaccine-preventable diseases. So we need to give vaccines after cancer treatment to restore your previous immunity. And also, in certain survivors, we need to boost immunity if you're at high risk for getting um, a vaccine-preventable pre disease that you weren't previously at risk for. And also just to keep up with the vaccines that everyone needs to stay healthy. So how do we restore the immunity that you had before cancer treatment? So usually about six to 12 months after finishing treatment, your treatment team will go ahead and test you um, using a blood test to see what your immune status is. Um, they can also test to see if you still have antibodies to some of the vaccine-preventable diseases where you've received vaccines before. And then they can get a schedule for you, and you can get re-immunized to the diseases that you need to be re-immunized for. So we restore your baseline level of immunity that you had before cancer treatment. And also because sometimes, especially with kids, they might be on treatment for two or three years or longer. They may have missed some vaccines that their um, other kids at their age were getting, and so they need, may need to catch up on those as well. And then that extra protection that some cancer survivors need. So we know that certain cancer treatments can put the cancer survivor at higher risk for getting certain vaccine-preventable diseases. 
And these are treatments that affect the spleen. So if you had your spleen removed by surgery during treatment, or you had high doses of radiation to the spleen, then you may need extra protection. If you had treatment that affects the lungs, so radiation to the lungs, or certain chemotherapies that affect the lungs, or surgery on the lungs, or if you had a transplant and you developed chronic graft-versus-host disease, which, is, which can happen after transplant, if any of these things apply to you, then you might need extra protection with certain vaccines. And then your age group. So there are vaccines recommended across all age groups, and you should be aware of what vaccines are recommended for your age. Talk with your health care provider. And in general, most cancer survivors need to get all the vaccines that are recommended for their age group, unless there's a specific reason why you shouldn't. So let's talk about a few of the vaccines, um, some of the more common ones. So pertussis. Pertussis is also known as whooping cough. Some people call it the 100-day cough. And can you imagine having a cough for 100 days? It really does happen. And we've actually had a recent epidemic of this in California. You may have heard about it on the news. So people of all ages can get whooping cough. It affects adults, and especially teenagers and young children. They're all at risk. The kids that are at highest risk are actually the youngest. So infants are more likely actually to die from whooping cough. Um, there's a very effective vaccine. It's given in combination with tetanus and diphtheria. So you've seen, you've probably seen these initials, the DTAP or the Tdap vaccine protects you against pertussis. So the next time you go to get a tetanus shot, check to see if you've had your pertussis component of that shot. If you've not had it, then that would be something you want to get when you get your tetanus updated. Pneumococcal vaccine. So pneumococcal vaccine protects against a form of bacteria known as streptococcus pneumonia. And this is a very nasty bacteria. It can cause pneumonia, but also meningitis, bloodstream infections, and other infections like ear infections. Pneumococcal disease kills more people in the United States every year than any other vaccine-preventable disease. And so it's really important for people who have a, a special risk for this disease to get protected against it. So cancer survivors who receive treatment that affects the lungs or the spleen or those who have chronic graft-versus-host disease are all at higher risk for this. There are also other people that are at risk for pneumococcal disease, and those are people who smoke, people who are diabetic, people who have chronic heart, liver, kidney, or lung conditions, including asthma, as well as very young children. So the vaccine dose and the type of vaccine you need depends on your age and your health history, but this is something to be aware of and to ask your health care provider if you need. Meningococcal vaccine is another vaccine that we have to protect against a very ser serious illness, um, that, that, uh, against a bacteria that causes a form of meningitis that can be very um, deadly. This has recently been in the news. There's been an outbreak um, very uh, close by in the Palm Springs area and in Los Angeles. So um, this is something that you want to be aware of as well, that cancer survivors who've received treatment that affects the spleen and those who have chronic graft-versus-host disease need protection um, with this vaccine, the meningococcal vaccine as well. It's also recommended for all of our adolescents, um, as, as well as people who live in residence halls, so people who live in um, college dorms, people in the military, and people who work in laboratories that are exposed to this bacteria all need this protection. So... You may be having questions about some of the things we've talked about. And one thing I'm hoping you might be thinking of is, wouldn't it be great if there was a vaccine that could prevent cancer? So what do you all think? Good idea? Would you be surprised to know there already is? So we actually have a vaccine. It's been out since 2006. It's the human papillomavirus vaccine, or the HPV vaccine. And this vaccine pr uh, protects against cancers that are caused by this particular virus. 
So cervical cancer is the most well-known. The HPV vaccine protects against the H HPV infection, which is also related to other cancers, um, cancers of the reproductive tract in males and females, as well as head and neck cancers. Um, HPV is a sexually transmitted disease. At least half of the people who are sexually active in the world will acquire HPV at some point in their lifetime. So we do have vaccines for this to prevent this, and they are um, particularly targeted at young people, so age 9 to 26, for both males and females. And this is a three-dose series given over six months. We also have vaccines that are recommended for everyone. So everyone who's six months of age or older needs to get the flu vaccine every fall. Very, very important. We need to get the flu vaccine every fall because the flu virus is always mutating. And so that's why we have to update our flu vaccine every year is because that virus is always changing. And there are certain viruses that do that that make it more more challenging to keep us all up to date with our vaccines, and the flu is certainly one of them. So this list of vaccines are the currently recommended vaccines for kids that are up to 18. It's a long list. It's actually a wonderful list. Um, when I was young, there were very few of these vaccines available. Um, my kids, who are now young adults, there weren't that many of these vaccines available. There's many, many more vaccines that have become available in recent years, and our kids are getting better and better protected all the time against some very, very serious diseases um, that can be prevented with vaccines. So here's just a chart, and I don't, I don't want you to memorize this chart, but just to know that all this information is, is readily available so that you can make sure that your children are up to date with their vaccines and there's similar charts that are available for adults to make sure that you're protected against all the diseases that we have protection against. So what about for adults? Well, we know all adults need to be protected against the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. Pertussis, the whooping cough. Um, so all of us need at least one um, booster of that, as well as the tetanus and diphtheria every 10 years. And then so these are on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on whether you've ever had the disease, whether you're in the right age group for the disease, and whether you have special risk factors. Um, so this is all to be discussed on an individual basis with your health care provider. And you definitely want to keep records of all the vaccines that you've had so that you can make sure that you've had everything you need and that you can get boosters when you need them. So be sure and review your vaccine needs with your health care providers. Get your vaccines updated. So get protected now. Make sure to get the flu vaccine every fall. And be sure and keep up to date with all the vaccines you need. Vaccines are one way to really boost your immunity. Many of us hear about all kinds of, of things on television where they tell you that taking a certain supplement will help to boost your immunity, and, and many of those things don't really work. But these really do. They do boost your immunity, and it's something that you can do to protect your health. So we urge all of our childhood cancer survivors to take charge of your health. Make sure your vaccines are up to date. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, our next speaker is uh, Steve Eggleston. Steve is, he earned his Bachelor's of Science degree in kinesiology in 1998 and his clinical doctorate in physical therapy. Sit down, I have a long thing to say about you. His clinical doctorate in physical therapy in 2002, both from the University of Southern California. After he graduated, Steve immediately began working at City of Hope. So he's never left City of Hope. He loves it so much. He worked for five years as the primary inpatient pediatric physical therapist, and patients loved him there. But then he transitioned to the outpatient setting, where he currently treats both adult and pediatric populations once they've been discharged home. I knew to love him there. <clears throat> Steve has a passion for sports, computers, Woodworking. Anybody wants cabinets made, he'll do it for you. He plays with his two daughters, ages three and five, 
and he helps his patients reach their goals and achieve their potential. Steve is the most amazing physical therapist anybody can ask for. So Steve, welcome. on this, we'll see about that. All right, oh, that's not a good start. So Carla just told me that we have the green light to do 30 minutes straight exercise. Is that right, Carla? You guys didn't buy that? You guys really? didn't buy that, really? Oh, too, bad. Oh, too bad. All right. So, show of hands, how many people exercise right now, regularly? Regularly is more than three times a week, Dr. Bhatia. Yeah, really? That many? Okay. That was. Let me tell you all about it. That's my segue. All right. So, not that many hands. I actually see a couple of my previous victims in PT over there in the department. It's good to see you guys here. Um, so let me get here. Actually, um, there, the um, American Cancer Society has what are, they call form, formal guidelines to survivorship that involve really specifically now um, how to maintain health, uh, how to maintain fitness. your physical fitness. I'll just go through a couple of their points uh, that they made, and these are accessible online uh, at www.cancer.org. Um, first one is achieve and maintain a healthy weight. Uh, it seems pretty straightforward, but um, now they've actually made these official formal guidelines. Um, but actually during treatment, they're looking at not gaining or losing too much weight. <clears throat> whether you're healthy or overweight at the time, so trying to keep that weight in check and balance. Uh, and actually, weight loss after the recovery, or after recovery from treatment, may actually benefit those who are overweight or obese. Second guideline is be physically active. Yay, I like that one a lot. Um, studies show that exercise is safe during treatment. I know a lot of you wish that maybe it wasn't, but uh, it actually is to do during treatment. And uh, we highly recommend it. And our physical therapist inpatient, when folks are going through it, uh, you'll see them very regularly, if not once a week, uh, up to five times a week inpatient. Um, so uh, it's going to improve your different aspects of health. Uh, it's going to fight fatigue and depression, which are uh, readily prevalent when you're going through treatment uh, for some folks. Um, and then physical activity after diagnosis is linked to living longer. So that's a big, big motivator. Uh, reducing your risk of cancer returning among people uh, with breast, colorectal, prostate, and ovarian cancer. So those are all uh, good things to shoot for. As far as the third guideline, I'll leave that up to Devani. She'll be talking about that in a little while. But eat healthy foods. It's pretty straightforward, pretty basic. Uh, harder to do than to talk about, really. It's uh, a little more challenging. But uh, Devani will give you some guidelines about how to do that after we're done chatting about exercise. Um, so obesity and cancer. <clears throat> uh, it does happen, and we do have our overweight patients. And actually, uh, to be honest with you, there's a lot of overweight patients that come and see me after treatment, uh, whether it's for prostate surgery or for post-transplant or depending on the situation. I do actually see quite a bit of obesity in the outpatient setting. So uh, it's important to keep in mind that obesity is known to be associated with diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and high blood pressure. And it's also linked in the incidence of these cancers that are up here. You guys ever heard of BMI, the term BMI, the three letters? Yeah, show of hands, OK. Anybody know how to calculate it on their own? No? I'm going to leave this up a second just so you can take a look at it. It's just basically your body mass index. Um, it's a good gauge when you're talking about obesity if you're concerned with it. Uh, the calculation is actually up top. Uh, BMI is basically your weight in kilograms over your height squared in meters. And I also put down on the bottom, there are other factors. Body type uh, is one of them. Um, but for the most part, this equation works pretty well. Uh, for figuring that out. All right, I'm going to move forward here. So with exercise, hopefully everyone knows this, but it's an important point to bring up. If you think about eating and exercise, 
if the amount of calories you consume are less than, or more than the amount of calories you expend, you're left with a surplus, which means that your body has to store that surplus. So the idea is, for most part, to try and make that balanced. In some cases, if you're obese, trying to make the calories taken in to be less than the calories you're outputting as far as exercise is concerned. Does that make sense? Okay. This is a fancy, fancy uh, graph here of what it looks like. You can access it anywhere online if you want to look up how your body weight compares and where your BMI is. Uh, it has the weight on the side and then the height on the, on the bottom. Very quick and easy to figure out. So a couple terminology things as we're chatting here a little bit more. Exercise is basically planned activity. Planned, structured, repetitive body movement performed to achieve a task uh, or to uh, maintain one or more physical fitness components, as, as the slide says. Uh, and physical activity is just basically doing something that requires skeletal muscle um, and energy expenditure. So there's, you know, physical activity is not the same as exercise. It's a completely different animal, um, which is why we're talking about it. So how much exercise do you need? I don't see a lot of, some kids, kind of kids, but not quite kids. Um, for adults, 30 minutes, five days a week of moderate activity. Uh, they recommend 40 to 45 to 60 minutes. It's a little bit harder when people are talking about their daily routines, going to work. It's harder to find 60 minutes or 45 minutes. So uh, 30 minutes will, will do, but 45 to 60 is much better. And then as far as kids are concerned, they should be more active. It's 60 minutes, five days a week, five days or more a week. So you heard me mention moderate intensity exercise. What does that mean? Well, moderate intensity. Makes you breathe basically as hard as you would if you went, do, did a brisk walk, not too hard, uh, not huffing and puffing, but you notice you're, you're exerting yourself a little bit, maybe a little bit of perspiration, just a slight amount, um, and then your heart rate and breathing will increase as, uh, as it will during moderate activities. And then you start talking more vig vigorous activity, that's when you start working out a little bit harder. You're having a hard, you're having a hard time talking at the same time of doing exercise. Um, you're taking deep breaths, the frequency is increasing, and you're sweating, depending on how hard you're working out, pretty profusely. That gets us to heart rate. How many of you know how to measure your own heart rate? Couple? Couple? All right. Radial pulse? Is that how everybody knows? So, just so you know, and I want everybody to try it out, never measure your pulse with your thumb. That's got a pulse of its own. So we want to go ahead and use our two index and middle finger, put them right here where your thumb basically meets your, your wrist, and try and find your radial pulse if you've never done that. And if you don't push too hard, you might feel a little thump, thump, hopefully. Uh, well, that's, a, that's usually the best and most convenient way to, to capture your pulse, but sometimes you can use a heart rate monitor or, or other, other devices. But if you can find it, uh, the easiest way to also measure your heart rate is just to count, count how, many, how many pulses you feel in six seconds. Six seconds, get a clock, count it for six seconds, and then add a zero to that number. So if mine's seven, I just add a zero, 70 beats a minute. Um, and that's the easiest way to do it. Now, during exercise, there's this thing called maximum heart rate. Um, yeah, it's another equation to, to throw up there, but maximum heart rate just basically means you really shouldn't, at your age, be getting your heart rate. There's not really any re regular reason for you to get your heart rate over that number. So it's 220 minus your age. That's, how, that's the easy equation for heart rate. And this is for a normal normal adult, normal child, normal adolescent who hasn't gone through cancer, but I'll get to that point in a minute. Um, so then we get back to moderate intensity versus vigorous intensity. Probably appropriate is moderate, in moderate intensity for most folks, um, and that number is about 50 to 70 percent of your maximum heart rate. So you just take that, your maximum heart rate that you found, and you multiply it by 0.7 or 0.5, and that's how you get where your heart rate should be during exercise. 
to achieve those different levels of exercise. And the same goes for vigorous. You're going to be a little bit higher, 70 to 85% of uh, maximum heart rate. All right, so for cancer survivors, um, you got to take into account the cardiotoxicity of chemotherapies, uh, what your heart through, went through during treatment, um, and then you always, always, always should check with your oncologist or your primary care physician to figure out if it's going to be appropriate for you at any point in time to do exercise, uh, considering what you've been through. Um, the values that I, that, the, that I gave you previously, um, they're adjusted values. Um, they're simply just a reference for you to look at. Uh, if you, wanna, if you want uh, the specific numbers again afterwards, I'll be happy to give them to you. Um, and then, but of course, you should always talk to your, to your doctors about what's okay for you, what's the better. If you did a certain number, let's say it was 120 beats a minute at moderate exercise levels that you think was appropriate, you should always just check with your doctor and make sure that they, they feel the same. These are just some examples of moderate and vigorous activities that you'll run into on a regular basis. That makes it quick and easy to kind of look at. You can take a peek and see what's most interesting to you, or do you do any of those on a regular basis? Um, you know, playing volleyball is not somebody everybody does every day, but it is considered a, a moderate level activity. Um, jogging, running fast, doing those kind of things are a little more vigorous. Um, but probably most of us are doing walking, maybe a little bit of dancing, possibly biking on a stationary bicycle or a moving one. Um, and then if you're doing yoga on the side, that's also another activity. So it's a, it's a, it's a good list as far as uh, getting the basics in there. So hopefully those all, somebody's doing at least some of those in their daily activity. So recommendations before you start an exercise program, of course, after you've talked to your doctor um, and discuss, you know, if, especially if you've had any of these kind of therapies, hormone therapy, abdominal or groin surgery, uh, multiple myeloma, or osteoporosis. So if you haven't been exercising up till now, which I saw a couple hands, not very many, but if you haven't been exercising up until now, so this might be appropriate, start slow. Don't try and go 100 miles an hour to start. That's not the point. It's just to get used to it. Get your body used to it. Get your body back into things. Um, overwhelm it. Because if you overwhelm it, you're going to tire yourself out. You're not going to want to go back and do it again. So just take your time. It's not, uh, it's the tortoise and the hare thing. So keep it slow. Keep it easy. Um, moderate intensity is okay. And if you can only do it for five to ten minutes, that's fine. That's all right. That's, that's completely fine. If you add up these little chunks to do your 30 minutes a day extra other than just doing your walk-in, getting around, going to work, um, that's okay too. So three sessions of 10 minutes done throughout the day was going to be as beneficial. So those are all okay. How do you improve your fitness? So those of you who have been exercising and maybe have gotten used to doing exercise and do a regular routine, that's good. But at the same time, you also to keep it interesting and keep it uh, lively, play around with the intensity, how often you're doing it, how, how hard you're exercising when you exercise. You can do that by checking your heart rate, um, frequency, and then duration of the levels of exercise that you're doing. Or if you're biking or if you're running or walking, maybe try swimming. Try something to work other muscles to keep you entertained and engaged because uh, it's very, very easy to get bored with your regular routine if that happens. Also, choose an activity you like. Choose something you enjoy doing. You know, everybody's going to do stuff that they enjoy doing a lot more frequently than they're going to do stuff that they just can't stand doing. Um, and don't worry, you're going to have setbacks. It happens to everybody. Just be patient with it. Um, but regularity, keep it regular. Always working it. Always exercising. Don't, don't give up on it. What about fitting it into our daily lives? We had... Uh, we had a little break before coming in here today after work, so I took the opportunity. I practiced what I preached, and I hop on the bicycle in the gym for 20 minutes before I came in. Finding time like that is crucial. Um, anywhere you can find it. Um, if, you can, uh, if you can go the stairs or do some other activities during the day, which are just regular movements that you do during the day, that's perfect. Also, a support system. Many of us have family members who are supporting you, especially going through treatment. Uh, use that support system. 
Uh, have them help you continue your exercises. Don't, they, they won't let you give up when it gets tough. Little things add up. Uh, plan vacations rather than driving trips. Active vacations, hiking in the mountains, going camping. Those kind of things are always great. Uh, exercise at lunch with your workmates, your family. Go dancing, go out dancing, have a good time. Those are all exercises. We don't think about that a lot of times when we go out dancing or exercising. Those are, those are great exercises. They build up the, uh, make your heart, heart pump a little faster, sweat a little bit more. Um, if you want to be extra motivating to yourself, wear a pedometer. You can check it out on a daily basis. One day you're going to do more, one day you're going to do less. Oops, sorry, this one. And then overall, and above your recommended daily exercise, you can increase your daily activity by doing any one of these things, which is, uh, I put, the one was, the, I think maybe I get this slides back up, but join a sports team, walk or bike, use stairs rather than an elevator, go dancing, all that stuff. So, that being said, I was kind of joking about what we were going to do, but then I'm kind of not joking about what we're going to do. So, I think it's time for us to... Do a little exercise. What do you guys say? All right. You guys can stay seated. I'm going to put on a little music. And uh, why don't you go ahead, if you're going to participate, if everything's OK, you haven't had any heart issues, um, everybody's been to the doctor recently, I hope. It's not going to be that bad. Um, just go ahead and scoot your chair back. Give yourself a little bit of room. We're going to do a little bit of exercise, maybe a minute or two. And then what I want you to do afterwards is see if you can find your heart rate then. And if you did take the time to find out what your maximum heart rate was, you can kind of compare it and see how long it take you, took you to get your heart rate up a little bit more with just one to two minutes of exercise. All right. So first, we're going to march in place, just sitting. So just follow my lead, all right? So up we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10. Now, let's get our arms into it. Punch out. There we go. Good. Two, three, four. Excellent. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What about up? Alternate. Up. Two, three, four, five, six. Don't forget to breathe. Seven, eight, nine, ten. And give me some applause. One, two, three, four. Thank you so much. Four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Keep going. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 50, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Now circles. Oh, yeah, keep marching. Don't stop marching. What am I seeing? Some legs stopping moving over there. Here we go. Good. Feel the arms burn. Keep going. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, backwards. One, two, three. You guys doing okay? Four, five, six, seven. Remember, oh, that's one minute mark. That's only one minute, guys. All right. Now, punch up towards the ceiling. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We should probably switch to the legs, don't you think? Okay, let's do the legs. Here we go. And kick. One, two, three. Feel like the Rockettes. Four, five. It's okay to move the rest of your body. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, now bring the knees up. One, two. Work those abs. Three, four. If you want to get tricky, bring them up and bring them out. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Keep them up. Five, six. You should feel your legs, stomach. Everybody's slowing down out there. What's going on? Legs out and in. Out. Yeah, you got to make sure you get a lot of room. Three, four, five. That's two minutes. You guys good? Oh, everybody's stopping. All right, all right. Good job, guys. Nicely done. Thank you, Steve. Um, our last speaker is uh, Dhwani Bho. You got us breathless, Steve. Dhwani Bhatt. Um, Dhwani is a registered dietitian. She's a certified. She's a certified specialist in oncology, nutrition, and a certified diabetes educator. She has experience in pediatrics as well as in hematopoietic cell transplant, which was formerly called bone marrow transplant as well as in diabetes. She has worked at City of Hope for 22 years, 20 really. 
She is quite the favorite with everybody, adults and pediatrics. Dwani? I don't know about all of you, but I'm still huffing and puffing too. <laughs> um, what I'm gonna do is to talk about some of the guidelines and I know uh, Steve has gone. Okay. Is it better? Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some of the guidelines um, that Steve has already uh, shared with you some also, and then we'll go about how we can work that around to make us help in the regular, our daily life. These are the USDA's dietary guidelines. They are very similar to the American Cancer Society's guideline also, so which we'll go over also. that in a minute also. This is for everybody, all Americans, um, that they have come out in two years ago. The, again, the first one is to maintain a balance of food over time. Healthy weight is a key issue at this point, so that's the reason why they want to make sure that we are taking in the calorie and burning as many of it so we can keep the healthy weight. The se second guideline is, again, to increase physical activity, and Steve has already gone over that with us for that. The other guideline is to reduce sodium intake. They want to cut down the uh, intake of salt. Um, it used to be before that they used to say uh, minimum uh, uh, intake used to be around 3,000 milligram, but now they have come down um, to 2,300 milligram per day. And the key reason is a lot of us are using processed products, so we tend to get a lot more salt. So that's the reason why they're pushing for a little bit more salt, cutting down some of the uh, more salt intake. Also to increase the fruits and vegetables in the diet, and choosing the variety is a key thing. Key other issue that they want to um, address is also three to five servings of calcium sources in diet. Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily milk, but again, um, milk is a good source of calcium, but you can have other uh, calcium, like some broccoli and spinach and some of the other uh, vegetables also have some calcium in it. So it's just like basically, if people are lactose intolerant, choosing some of the other sources which have calcium. Whole grains uh, increasing their um, you know, intake in the diet and increasing fiber is one of the other guidelines. When you do choose protein, choosing leaner choices and low fat option is um, recommended. And when you choose fat, uh, at least choosing more, uh, less of a saturated fat is one of the uh, guidelines. And whenever you can, using, um, including some omega-3s in the diet is also uh, encouraged. Cutting down the cholesterol to less than 300 milligrams per day. And for food safety, proper food is encouraged also. Again, uh, those were the general population guidelines. These are the specific guidelines by American Cancer Society and American Institute of Cancer Research. They're very similar to the dietary guidelines, but there are a couple of things that they are a little bit more um, stressing on that. Maintaining a, maintaining a healthy weight is important, but also physically active lifestyle is encouraged. And um, uh, they highly encourage emphasis on plant foods, and they are encouraging more than five servings of fruits and vegetables per day. The optimum intake is they're recommending is seven to nine servings of fruits and vegetables per day. Also choosing whole grains is also one of the guidelines. And limiting the consumption of alcohol, sugary beverages, and energy-dense food is um, recommended, and again, that is to basically to um, help with the healthy weight also. And pro uh, avoiding the process and red, uh, you know, red meat is uh, one of the other guidelines. We're gonna talk about some of these guidelines to go over a um, little bit in more detail. Whole grains um, or fiber is essential for healthy diet. High fiber foods are usually legumes, whole grains, beans, nuts and seeds, and of course the fruits and vegetables. Um, most whole grain uh, foods are very, uh, grains are rich in vitamins, mineral, antioxidant, and fiber, of course. Um, when you're trying to cook with whole grains, or trying to use more whole grains, what you want to do is use brown rice versus using the white rice. Whenever you choose pasta, whole wheat pasta is better for you. When you choose bread, don't just choose the brown bread, because brown bread, just the color is sometimes a 
car caramel color that they put it in there. So you want to actually look for the um, guidelines on saying whole grain or specific uh, you know, information on that. And also you can choose cereals which are you know, high fiber and when you're using recipes, you can always add those in, instead of the regular uh, options. In breads and cakes and cookies, you can try substituting whole wheat flour. Usually if you try to do 100% of that, it does not, may not work out as well. So you can start with one fourth of, or, you know, and then see, work it up to about half of the all purpose flour. That usually works pretty good. If you try to do 100% whole grain with a new recipe, sometimes it may not work as well. And again, in the casseroles or soups also, you can always replace if it calls for rice or pasta, you can always go with the brown rice or a whole wheat um, uh, pasta also. Let's talk about fruits and vegetables. That's one of the key things that um, is everybody is stressing on at this point because we want to at least to have minimum five servings of fruits and vegetables per day. We do uh, recommend having whole fruits versus juices. Um, again, it's okay to have some juices, but it, it ca can be very dense in calories. And a lot of time you may not realize that one orange is very, you know, rich in vitamin C, of course, but has a lot of fiber, but the same orange, when you actually put it in a juice, is not very much quantity. And if you really try to have a whole eight ounces or 10 ounces of juice, it becomes too many uh, calories for you without getting the benefit of the fiber and other nutrients. Fruits and vegetables are high in fiber. They have a lot of vitamins and minerals also, and they support the immune system. They are very rich in antioxidant and phytonutrients. That's something which is only present in fruits and vegetables. You can't get that from any other food, the phytonutrients. They're naturally low in calories and fat also. Most of the fruits and vegetables are, uh, other than avocado and coconut, most of them have no fat at all. Um, also, um, we encourage everybody to have a variety of um, you know, colors as far as choosing fruits and vegetables. And dark colored fruits and vegetables have a lot of um, antioxidants in them. How do you cook them? Steaming, broiling, microwaving, or baking is a better choice. And we do uh, recommend you avoid frying or uh, avoid using creamy sauces. So zucchini is great for you, but on the other hand, um, having zucchini with the butter on top may not be the best choice. As far as the fruits and vegetables, they are um, encouraged for overall healthy diet and they may reduce the risk of heart disease and stroke also. And they also have shown now to prevent against many cancers also. That's one guideline that American Cancer Society um, has come out is for most everything, fruits and vegetables uh, provides a protective effect. They are also beneficial because it has high in fiber and it uh, helps us um, avoid the risk of overweight, um, you know, being obese and uh, also helps with heart disease and type two diabetes. Uh, fruits and vegetables is also a very good, um, good source of potassium, which can help lower the blood pressure. It reduces the risk of uh, kidney stones and also uh, helps prevent um, increased bone loss. Fruits and vegetables are also, if you uh, compare the calorie-wise, they are one of the lowest in calories. One cup of, um, if you look at spinach, is less than 20 calories, versus if you look at one cup of pasta, that comes out to be about 250 calories. So you get a, you know, a, you can get a large quantity for very low calories. These are just a, a colorful um, uh, information that uh, kind of help us guide through what kind of fruits and vegetables we should have. What we usually look at is five different groups. We look at that because each different color has different kind of uh, phytonutrients and antioxidants. So that's the reason why we recommend you choosing different colors. Red colored uh, fruits fruits and vegetables like tomatoes, watermelon, guava, grapes, they have lycopene, which is one of very strong phytochemicals. The orange and yellow color fruits and vegetables like oranges and apricots or uh, squashes have beta carotene, vitamin C, and lutein. The green color like broccoli, spinach, Brussels sprouts have um, indoles in them. And the purple and blue, and again, I'm sure that everybody has heard about, about the you know, dark color grapes. Um, blueberries, blackberries, and eggplant. A lot of time I have to point out here that everybody, everybody knows about the red wine is being so good for the heart. The reason red wine is good for you is because of it's made from red grapes. So that's the key thing that you want to remember. That's why it's, you know, it's a good to have uh, red grapes. 
Again, the white um, category is where you have the garlic, the mushrooms, and cauliflower. Some of you may have already have heard about it that um, they're working on, uh, there are some uh, studies going on right now with the mushroom that they have a protective effect for breast cancer. Um, and again, it actually, if they're looking at it also for the prostate cancer because they feel that the mushroom has something which is uh, beneficial for protective effect. When you're looking at the protein, the protein is a building block for muscles, uh, cartilage, and skin, and enzyme, and hormones also. And it's one of the nutrient uh, category of nutrient that provides calorie. Calories, as we know, is a token of energy. The others are fat and carbohydrate. Um, but protein is important not just for the calories, but because it's a building block. The source, sources of protein are your meat, uh, fish, chicken, dry beans, eggs, nuts, and seeds. We do get some protein from uh, grains also. So people who are vegetarian usually end up getting their protein from dairy products or grain. And it also provides, it's a rich source of B vitamins. Healthy protein choices is fish because they have omega-3s, which is a good kind of fat. And uh, it's, it's a protective and it's a, for heart problems also. Um, we, when you choose other choices, um, chicken and um, you know, fish is good for you, but when you choose chicken or turkey, we recommend you avoiding the skin. And people who are vegetarian, they can have beans or lentils, or nuts, and soy products. Whenever you try to cook them, we recommend you avoiding fry frying and usually, usually try to go for roasting or broiling or grilling. Um, for red meats, they do have a guideline by American Cancer Society that limit the red meat to less than 11 ounces per week or three to four ounces um, two to three times per week. Other um, part of the American Cancer Society guideline is that avoid sugary beverages, um, sodas, also, we uh, encourage you to have avoid uh, some of the sports beverages also because, again, they're very high in calories. When you do consume fast food, you can use it sparingly. It's not that you can never go out to eat uh, in some one of the fast food places, but just try to do it on moderately, not something that you would do it every night. Whenever um, possible, avoid moldy grains and legumes because that's where uh, there's more chances of food poisoning and infection. We do recommend you can, uh, limiting the consumption of energy dense food like French fries or cookies, cakes, and pies. <laughs> Also, um, limit the consumption of processed foods and uh, limit the intake of salt. And alcoholic beverages, uh, um, again, uh, for men, no more than two servings per day, and women is uh, one serving per day. Healthy weight is one of the other guidelines. Be within the normal range of body weight, and um, we sh uh, saw some information from Steve about the BMI also. The guideline is to ensure that weight through childhood and uh, adolescence is towards the lower end of the BMI at age 21, and maintain the weight within the normal range after 21 also, and avoid weight gain and increase in waist circumference through the adulthood. Again, this is information on body mass index. This is not the only guideline to look at the um, person's over, uh, you know, stature as far as the overweight or obesity, but this is one of the easiest guidelines that we can use. This is of something that we usually use for screening on, in a very quick manner. And again, we did see all the information that Steve uh, shared with us, so I'm going to go ahead and for, you know, skip that part. Now, we know that healthy weight is very important, so what can we do when we see the ice cream and the pizza and everything? So I'm going to go over some of the guidelines for how we can achieve that. Again, the first step is, again, healthy diet, balance our ca uh, balancing our calorie, and adopt adopting a physically uh, active lifestyle. One other key thing as far as uh, cutting down the calories or healthy um, quantity of food, we recommend you reducing the portion sizes. If you're used to having a large plate, we re usually recommend you going, going for smaller plates. Avoid cooking large quantities. Whenever you have leftovers, for example, you, have a, you made a nice big cake, if it's there in the house, you feel more likely tempted to go and get it, eat it. But if it's not there, then you're not gonna, you don't have it, so you're not going to go and eat it. So we do recommend you, you know, cutting down um, quantity. Or if you do have something leftover, when the family or visiting, you have neighbors, or when you go to work, take it away. It's not in the house, then you're not going to eat it. Eat smaller dishes. 
Again, eat large portions of fruits and vegetables. If you have a plate, half the plate should be filled with vegetable. And then the quarter should be uh, you know, filled with uh, your protein choice and a little bit of the starch. That way, you're less likely to get extra calories on there. Since fruits and vegetables are very low in calories, that helps you with that. Eat smaller portion of, again, meat and starches and desserts. Of course, avoid second helpings. This is just a um, portion distortion. 20 years ago, if you look at the chocolate chip cookie, it was about 55 calories, and up, they were about one and a half inch in diameter. Nowadays, most places, when you go look for the chocolate chip cookies, they are a lot larger. But how do how many do? How, let's see how many calories we're going to come up with. 275 calories. They are usually about three and a half inch in diameter, and the difference is 220 extra calories there. Another example, chicken Caesar salad usually many years ago used to be about 390 calorie and maybe about cup, cup and a half of, uh, as a serving size. Nowadays, when you look at the chicken Caesar salad, they're big, they're very large portions. So it's a 790 calorie and about, you know, usually it's a pretty large size, about three and a half cup of it. And again, the difference here is about 400 calories. So the portions have become a lot bigger over the years, and again, that's something that we want to go back to um, and limit the portion sizes. As far as the fat is concerned, we want to choose healthier fats. Um, saturated fats or the trans fat are the two fats which have been linked to heart problems, and that's something that we do encourage you to cut down. Usually that's the reason why we want to cut down the coconut oil, whole milk products, because it does have saturated uh, fat, and also red meat. Chicken and fish is better for you because they're lower in fat. And whenever possible, um, instead of using butter and margarine, start using oil. Olive oil, canola oil, those are better kind of oil that you can use. Flaxseed is also another option. And whenever you um, try to get recipes, for example, you're going to a store to buy a cake mix. They have two kinds of cake mix. You can use it, one with the butter recipe also, and they have the one with the oil recipe also. You're better off choosing the one with the oil recipe, that way you can use the canola oil or one of some of the better oil, and that it's a better kind of. I know it's not the best choice, the, but when you do have it, at least it's a better kind of fat. In the dairy products, we always encourage you to use um, low fat or non-fat choices. Um, when you uh, have some of the recipes will call for sour cream, you can always try to use non-fat yogurt in there. Um, whenever you choose cheese, yogurt, or sour cream, go for the light or the non-fat. And whenever you choose eggs, it's better to have more egg whites and at least toss some of the yellow out. They have now egg uh, beaters or egg substitute, what we call it, is basically egg white. But it, it doesn't mean you have to buy those. You can buy the regular um, eggs also, just throw away the yolk, which is where the fat and the cholesterol is and use lean meats, and whenever you get a chance to avoid frying it, either stir fry, bake, or grill. These are some of the resources um, for that, um, uh, you know, that might be helpful for you. Um, our government has a, USDA has a website, with www.choosemyplate.gov. That's a very great resources, and part of that is something called Super Tracker. And I'm just going to share a little bit of information on that for you because it's a free website and you have lots of information available. A lot of people will go to Weight Watchers and a lot of people, and you know, th those things are helpful also. But a lot of time people will go to internet to try to find information on it. This is a free information which is um, tremendously helpful for most people. So those are some of the things that um, I'm going to share in a minute also. You can always ask your primary care uh, provider also to get, if you've needed a personalized plan, to go and see the dietitian. Again, some of the weight loss support groups are helpful also, but the, and the weight loss programs are also helpful. But key thing is we want to maintain weight so we can do whatever we can to best uh, meet, you know, come to, come to, you know, achieve that goal. This is the uh, site that I was talking to you about, and I think I'm going to try to do it live if I can now. This is part of uh, choosemyplate.gov that they've come out with. It's called the Super Tracker. And what it is, is um, you can actually put in your height and weight and what kind of activity you do, and it comes out with a, a how, many, uh, how much calories you should have. 
And also, you, it can guide you how many, um, the, if, you, if, if it tells you that you need 1,800 calories, it'll actually tell you how much servings of fruits and vegetables you should have or how many servings of um, bread you should have. Or, so it actually prints out a whole plan for you, which is absolutely free. You don't have to do anything. You know, it's just information that comes out uh, you know, based on your numbers that you're putting it in. Uh, it'll ask you for age and height and weight and exercise and you know, either male or female. Also, they have, this is a foodopedia, which is the information where you can actually put down for hamburger, and it'll tell you what is about the calorie level that you would expect from a hamburger. And it says specific information also based on different, um, sometimes, um, they have few, not so many, but for fast food area information also on there. Um, food tracker is actually will lets you put down how much you ate, and you can actually put down, okay, I had today one sandwich or one, um, uh, you know, chicken breast, and it'll tell you how many calories you've had so far. And also, it's a physical activity t tracker is really great also. You can put down your height and weight and tell them what exercise you did and how many minutes, and it'll calculate the calories for you also. So just, this is just a very basic information, and let's see if we can go try to do this. Yeah. Okay. This is the website choosemyplate.gov, and here, if you look at it, it tells you information on, like, for example, if I cl click on fruits right here, it'll tell you about what is a fruit, what is the portion sizes, and how much is needed. And this is just for general information that you can get. Then, if you wanted some more information, for, for example, on weight management. Let's go on the weight management part of it. And it'll, uh, it tells you what are your different goals, um, what is empty calories, and what are some of the beverages, how to make better choices. It also has inf uh, information on calories. So if you needed more information on calories, actually you can go there also. And they have uh, information on daily food plans. So, Again, this is a super tracker. So it tells you. It, uh, it has your own weight manager there. You can set your own goals, and you can get your reports automatically also. So again, I just wanted to share some of this information with all of you, is that you can put there's lots of you know, other things out there, but this is very reliable some information which is free and, you know, it's provided by USDA because they, their goal is, again, for everybody to have a healthy uh, weight. So that's something which is available. So just wanted to share that a little bit with you. And with that, I am done. Thank you. If anyone should have any questions, I can certainly bring the microphone to you, or you can write them on the note card, and we can give them to the panel as well. Hello, it's working. All right, um, the first question for the panel is, cancer at age seven, radiation to spine, does this cause problem for the colon? 2,500 rads to the brain and spine, is this a worry for breast cancer? If the total dose you had was 2,500 milligrams, you are not, I'm sorry, 200, uh, 2,500 centigrade, you are not in the risk factor for colon cancer with that dose. 
you also um, are not in a risk factor for breast cancer because your breast tissue was not hit with that dose and or with that uh, field. So I would just reiterate that um, to say that uh, we still don't know the dose of radiation that really truly increases the risk of colon cancer. So for now, um, for colon cancer, the recommendations are that you practice what you would do for screening if you didn't have any cancer. And then for breast cancer, these are amazing questions. These are questions that we're still trying to answer at this point. For breast cancer, spine radiation, the dose is still, we believe, quite low and uh, the risk of breast cancer is not as high as one would if one got chest radiation to the front of the chest. All right, the second question is regarding leukemia, ALL. What are the most common side effects that cancer survivors, teenagers, have encountered after the intense treatment, chemo? When do you want to take it? So teens who've had ALL, um, everything depends on what treatment you got. The question is asking about chemotherapy. So typically kids that have gotten chemotherapy for ALL have gotten drugs um, that involve steroids, so prednisone or decadron. Sometimes those can cause problems with the joints and some people will get uh, a disorder that's similar to arthritis, it can cause some pain. If you have that kind of pain, you should get that checked out. Um, another long-term effect can, uh, from the steroids can also affect the eyes. So it's very important to have your eyes checked to see if there's any effect on the eyes. One of the things we see with steroids can be cataracts. Um, another effect with the common chemotherapies we give for kids with ALL is um, weakening of the bones. And so this is where a person who normally in the teenage years, you're building up a lot of strength in the bones. Um, the calcium is going into your bones and making your bones quite strong. But sometimes there's a thinning of the bones, uh, thinner than it would be expected for someone who's a teenager. So there are things we can do for that. We can test for that, and we can certainly advise you to take extra calcium and do some specific exercise to build up your bones. Another thing we see in teenagers is sometimes because of the spinal taps that we're given, and some kids have had radiation to the brain, it can cause learning problems. So we do see some kids that are having learning problems. And again, we have testing that can be done and lots of advice and intervention that can be done with the schools to make learning go smoother. So those are, the, I think, the main, the main effects that we would see. There are some kids that have gotten certain kinds of um, chemotherapy, anthracycline chemotherapy, that can affect the heart, and we do testing for that as well, um, just to make sure the heart is staying strong and there's nothing that needs to be done for that. One question, though, many teenagers have is the therapy they're going to get cause them to be infertile. And the good news is for most leukemia therapy, if it does not involve a bone marrow transplant, the vast majority of people maintain normal fertility. And that's a question that's uh, often very concerning to people as they're teenagers and young adults. So just to reiterate, um, bone health, eye health, making sure that uh, your periods, if you're a girl, are happening on a regular time, if they're not checking with your doctor. The other thing that we need to be careful about is uh, with the steroids use, there's an increased risk of uh, what's called osteonecrosis. So hip pain, knee pain, that needs to be brought to the attention of the doctor so that they can then examine it, do the necessary tests to make sure that's not going on. Um, the next question is, can the slides be put on a website, please? Yes, I'm saying yes. I think we have to ask Becky that. Becky. Sure. And then the next question is, and will you post on the website when the slides are available, please? Okay. All right. So I said yes prematurely. Becky's the boss on that one. Um, the next question for Wendy 
Um, can you get the flu from a flu vaccine? So that's a great question. There's more than one type of flu vaccine. Um, the flu shot that you get, you cannot get the flu from that. The flu shot is a killed viral vaccine and, and it's not possible to get the flu from that. There is now a version of the flu vaccine that's a live uh, vaccine. It's a, what they call attenuated or a weakened vaccine that's given by nasal spray. It is possible to get a very mild case of the flu um, if you were to get the um, flu vaccine through the nasal vaccine, and that's recommended only for healthy adults up to 49 years old, or healthy people up to 49 years old. And we do not recommend it for people who are getting cancer treatment or who are around people who are getting cancer treatment. So not for the, for the siblings either. The next question again for Wendy is, the flu season runs from October through March, and one flu vaccine will cover a person for the whole year? So the flu vaccine is actually one of the more challenging vaccines that we have to deal with because the flu virus, as I mentioned, is always changing or mutating. Um, what, the, what the people do at the Center for Disease Control um, in the United States government, they get together every year and they, they predict what are going to be the flu viruses that are most common, um, that they think will, are going to cause the most illness in the upcoming flu season, and they put those, uh, they, protect, they protect you with the, the um, vaccine that would protect against those particular viruses. Sometimes they're, most of the time, they're very close to being right on, but occasionally they don't guess quite right. Um, so we can't say you're 100% protected from the flu with that one shot, but you're as, as good as you can get uh, based on the, the experts in the country that, that can predict that. And for the whole year. And for the whole flu season, exactly. Okay. And then again, follow up on uh, vaccines. How often do you need the pneumococcal vaccine? So the pneumococcal vaccine, it really depends on your risk factors. It's, uh, it's an individual decision. Um, everyone that's at risk needs at least one. And then there's booster shots that are given. And the number of booster shots that you need depends on your age and the condition that you're being protected against. So uh, oftentimes, um, boosters can be given every five years or so. But it de uh, I'm sorry, the, for the pneumococcal vaccine, five years after the first dose is booster dose typically, but it can vary depending on the condition. All right. And then there's a question about heart. Is it true that damage to the heart can show up 10 years after taking doxorubicin? Unfortunately, the answer to that is yes. Um, and one of the things we're looking at is when do side effects occur? Uh, and there are different risk factors. If you have a low dose of the doxorubicin or the anthracycline category of chemotherapy, theoretically you would have a lower risk. If you have a high dose, you would have a higher risk. But you also then need to take into your normal healthy lifestyle patterns. Um, again, maintaining weight, good exercise, diet, and getting screened and monitored so that if you do develop any type of heart problem, it is recognized early and interventions can be implemented. There's also studies going on right now to look at um, starting interventions early on before anyone has a problem to see if that prevents those problems from occurring down the road. And then just to add to that, that uh, if somebody's received doxorubicin as a child and then becomes pregnant, it's very important that they talk to their obstetrician and make sure that they go into a high-risk OB clinic because um, sometimes what can happen is that the patient is in their third trimester or during labor, the heart can go into failure because of the doxorubicin they'd received earlier. So that's an important thing to remember. Um, can you please explain ANC and blisters in the mouth? Carla. ANC means absolute neutrophil count. We all have white blood cells which fight off infection. And I like to think of white blood cells being similar to the category of automobile. So then we have lots of different subtypes of automobiles. You know, we have Toyotas and Hondas, et cetera. So for the white blood cells, we have things like neutrophils and lymphocytes um, and eosinophils, et cetera. The neutrophils are the type of white blood cell 
that is very important for fighting off bacterial infections. And so we look at what's the total number of white blood cells and then what are the percentage of neutrophils and that gives the absolute neutrophil count. We like the absolute neutrophil count to be, well normal is basically above 1500. We think it's good if it's above 500 when you're on ke cancer chemotherapy. But um, when your neutrophil count is low, it puts you at greater risk for developing infections. And so that's the time period that you have to be a little more cautious. You need to not be around sick people. You might have to avoid crowds and, and um, situations like that. And I forgot what the other part, part um, of the question the, was. The relationship with blisters, mouth, mouth sores. Oh. The reason the white blood cell count goes down low is after you get your chemotherapy, the chemotherapy prevents the bone marrow from making new white blood cells for a period of time. White blood cells have a very short lifespan. They only live about a week. And so if the bone marrow doesn't make white blood cells um, for several days, then you're going to have a week or two, and depending upon your therapy and a variety of other things, a period of time before your white blood cell count recovers. And the reason I brought that up again is because the cells that line your mucous membranes in your mouth also have a very short lifespan. I bet every person in this room has burned the uh, roof of their mouth on hot pizza one time or another. And remember how you get that sore and it hurts, but within a day or two it's gone? Well, that's because those um, cells recover quickly and they heal. But the chemotherapy, again, it halts the development of the new cells from um, occurring. And so typically when your white blood cell, re cell count recovers, if you have mouth sores, that's when you start seeing your mouth sores starting to recover because those are very short-lived um, cells that have a, what we call a rapid turnover. So then both of them are reflecting that the Hello? Okay, I got it back. It's just that the chemotherapy is hitting on the uh, killing off the white cells, the neutrophils, as well as the, the mouth cells. And when both of them are recovering, it's happening at the same time. So it appears as if there's a relationship between the two, but actually what it is is that the recovery is happening simultaneously. The last comment is um, a reminder to the audience by a member in the audience about getting and keeping medical records and history. City of Hope has a central facility where patients and legal guardians can obtain the patient's medical records. So this is absolutely true. But we also have a childhood cancer study done if they were to um, attend that particular survivorship clinic. We have a similar facility for breast cancer survivors as well as for prostate cancer survivors. And we are imminently opening one for bone marrow transplant survivors. So just to let you know. Any other questions? No? Well then, thank you very much for attending this session and we welcome you back. We hold this annually, and we rotate the topics. Some of our favorite topics and speakers stick around. They make us do exercises. But uh, we do rotate topics, and, and so please come back again next year. Thank you. Have a good night.